Welcome to the Lincoln City Council meeting of Monday, June 4th. Let's all rise for a Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silent meditation following. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, in accordance with LB 898, a copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted at the back of the chamber. The order of the business of the City Council is as follows. The clerk will call the items listed on the agenda under public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on an item should come forward after the clerk reads that item. The applicant and those in favor should speak first, then those opposed. The applicant may then make one short rebuttal. Each speaker should begin by stating name, address, and whether you are speaking in favor or in opposition to the item. Testimony is limited to five minutes per speaker. After all public hearings, the council will vote on resolutions and items listed under a third reading. On the second and last meetings of the month, immediately prior to adjournment, anyone may speak on any issue not on the agenda for that date, nor plan for a future agenda. Will the clerk please call the first item of business? Our first item is the election of a new chair. All right, um, at this time, I would like to take any nominations from my colleagues for the chair. Nominate Benny Shob to be our new chair. Benny Shob, nominated Second. by Lyrian, seconded by Cindy Lamb. Let's call the roll. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shob? Stay. <laughs> Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried five to zero. Terrific. Well, I will vacate the chair's position. This is a little bit. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate the support of the city council, my fellow council members, and we'll proceed with our agenda. Uh, the next item on our agenda would be the election of a vice chair for the city council. I'd like to open the floor for nominations. I would nominate Cindy Lamb. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Are there any other nominations? And then I would, I would move the nominations to be closed and ask the clerk to call the roll. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Rabel? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried <clears throat> six to zero. Thank you very much. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, the next on our item on our would, Teresa, would you call the next item? Let's yes, just do I like sure that. will. Yeah. Our next <laughs> item is the hazmat appeal for action only. If council wishes to make a motion. Okay. And a motion. I'm reading it. <laughs> yeah. Would it move approval. I'd like to hear a second. Second. I'd like Jeff to come up, please. <laughs> and you're moving approval of their appeal? A approval would be to grant their appeal. A denial would be to deny their appeal. Okay. We will, would move denial. Second. Of the, yes. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Councilwoman Lamb. Thank you. Um, I know this is this is really difficult because of the circumstances surrounding this and um, and the apartment complex and uh, that there's is there seemed to be a sense of a feeling of um, overreaction um, and I get that but at the same time it could have uh, been something that was more serious than anticipated and and I think that we have to err on the side of protection of all citizens especially when it's a residence where there's a number of people uh, living that could be affected and so um, I'm going to uh, approve affirming this but um, but, uh, but I recognize the uh, difficulty in in 
being the one who didn't have as great a danger, <laughs> which is both fortunate and expensive, and unfortunately. So, thank you. Other comments? Would, Teresa, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Thank you. Next, then, are our public hearing consent agenda, items one through three, if anyone wishes to address any item on the consent agenda, they may do so at this time. Madam Clerk, do we need to do something with item 1H? No. That will be coming forward at a later date. So should we remove it then from the consent agenda? No, because it's just placed on file. We're not really acting on anything. So if but no it, one, but if it's not the settlement agreement's not being handled this way. It's, maybe our city attorney would like to comment on that. As I understand it, the report says this is a settlement that the mayor authorized, and that's not the case. Well, you can make a motion to withdraw it. I mean, the report comes forward, but as as you're already aware, um, the resolution will come forward for your uh, discussion. And approval regardless of whether you remove it or not okay. um, I'd make a motion we remove item 1h second you have a motion by council councilman camp and a second by councilwoman lamb is there any discussion uh, oh sorry yep can I Jeff sorry yeah. Lirian, please Could you just define for everyone what placing something on file means because I think that might be part of the confusion well, uh, there are a number of reports that come before the, the council that this is placing them on the agenda makes the action of receiving them formal and, and public, and by putting them on the public agenda, it, it makes the public more aware of them, as well as the members of the council. And it's, it's not an endorsement. It's just acknowledging receipt or transfer of information? Right. I mean, okay. for example, when you've got the uh, distribution of funds representing the interest earnings, I mean, it's important for, I think, the council to be aware of that cash flow, but you're not in a position of saying, well, this is wrong or we're going to do something different with it. It's just a report. And when we, when we come forward with the, the report of new impending claims, which is coming right up on the agenda, there you're statutorily required to take action on that. So that's the difference. Does that help clarify what it's doing there? But, you know, as far as the motion goes to remove it from the uh, agenda, I think it's going to come before you regardless of whether you remove it or not. So if you vote to remove it, it doesn't cause any issues. It doesn't change the resolution coming forward. And so the fact that you approve it, uh, Mr. Camp's motion, does not change what's going to happen. So it, it doesn't what cause does it any do? confusion. What, what does it do, though, if we reject acknowledging it? Uh, in this case, it, it wouldn't make any change what, whatsoever. Uh, I suppose if you reject it in a report, you're signaling to the administration that you've got some sort of a problem with it. But it wouldn't have an effect legally. So, Mr. No, well, the reason I made the motion is the report is inaccurate because the mayor didn't have the authority to reach a settlement with the uh, rail yard, and as a result, I think the report, and upon further inquiry of you, you over, over a couple of days, you decide, no, that isn't the way this can be handled. And so to report that the mayor had this settlement is not, it's not appropriate, and to leave it on our uh, file would be a, a misinformation to the public. Well, it was a settlement agreement that was reached among the parties. The JPA board, as you're aware of, has voted to adopt that. The, uh, it has no authority because it's a redevelopment agreement between the city yeah, and the Western JPA market, yeah. and TDP. So the JPA board had to adopt it as one of the parties to that redevelopment agreement. And so uh, you do have the settlement agreement. Whether or not it has to come before um, the, this body or not is, is really up for interpretation. And I, would, and I can elaborate more on when the resolution comes before this body. Uh, there are some things that are going to be in the gray area. I think this is one of those. If things are in the gray area, my philosophy as the city attorney is they should come before the city council. If they're, 
they could go one way or the other, they should come before the city council. And I do that keeping in mind the, in the value of your time. Uh, and so we're not going to try to start putting everything on the agenda and filling up your time with things that are relatively minor. And so it becomes a matter of judgment. In this case, it was my judgment that it should come before the council. Well, I appreciate that. Just when I talked to you six days ago, this was all that was going to be done. And then the mayor, you had said at that time, had the authority to sign this, which is not the case. And I just, I think that we need to have. Well, it would be a legal interpretation. I'm not, I wouldn't say absolutely the mayor doesn't have the authority to sign it. But you changed your position Thursday noon. I did look at the agreement and decide this is kind of in the gray area and could come before the council. Well, you didn't say that Tuesday it was in a gray area. You said it, that he had the authority. Right. So I just think the prudent thing is to take it off. Yes, we will have this before us, so there's no harm done, but that way there's no inaccuracy on the record. Carl, you want to speak, and then Jane? Yeah, um, I, I appreciate the fact that it, it will be on our agenda, is on our agenda for future. Uh, however, it just seems to me that, that this has been consistent, that we've had issues like this on our, uh, on our agenda, and uh, I don't... I think it's beneficial to have that, that information available to us so that we look and see that that report it was present there. Um, you could still look and see that it's proposed later on. I just like to see those kinds of things up front. And, and I would say, uh, in Mr. Camp's defense, this is unusual that we'd have a report that would later come before the council. I withdraw. I have a, thank Please, you. yes. Thank you. Um, if something in the settlement agreement is changed as a result of this matter being before us um, for hearing at a later date, will it change contents of this report? Because we don't have the report. We just have a cover page. Okay. Yes. It, it, well, it would. I mean, there is an agreement that has been reached. If this council would vote to reject that agreement, um, then... Well, it certainly would not change what has been approved by the JPA, but that agreement would not go into effect. And so whether you'd have a later settlement agreement that would be different, I can't say. It could be the parties would decide, okay, we'll just go on with the current agreement and not go back and try to renegotiate something different. And so would, is this incorrect? No, this is the agreement that was negotiated among the parties and that has been approved by the JPA board. But if we don't approve that, it could change. Well, if you don't approve that, there is no agreement among the parties, okay. and the settlement agreement is not binding on the parties. Okay. Thank you. I have a question I, quickly, and then oh, Mary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're just voting to acknowledge that we're receiving the report, and then John's motion was to not do that. John's motion would be to remove this report from the agenda officially. It's just a report, not the so, signed agreement, just a report. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, Larry. That, that's I wanted to know what a yes vote and a no vote would imply, and it. Okay. Well, please. If I may, me. thank you. So, um, I don't really. The report's not attached. <laughs> All that's really there is a cover page that says there is a report, mm -hmm. and so since we're not able to view it, I'm not comfortable affirming a report that may or may not change when there's nothing attached. So, that's just my comment. Well, I would, I would actually, I'm oh, sorry. No, please. As Cindy breaks up, brings up a good point, I have noticed time and time again, we get things that are placed on file, but they actually aren't linked. So the mm -hmm. sales tax revenues, for instance, the, I mean, the report on a lot of these numbers, we just get an acknowledgement. So if you're not comfortable voting on things that we aren't, don't have linked, then I guess we need to talk about whether or not we start linking more of these reports when they're placed on file. Right. Because and I, I think that is a separate issue, but it's a... An appropriate one for this council to consider. John. Now, the thing that concerns me is my understanding is at the West Haymarket meeting, JPA meeting, the mayor on behalf of the city, since he wore two hats there, one as a member of the JPA board, could approve that for West Haymarket JPA, but he also affirmatively approved it for the city. No, no, that's not true. And in fact, the mayor, although he's chair of the JPA board, cannot alter agreements. He's not the administrator of that the joint public agency and the reason why in that case the jpa board had to approve it is they have no administ they have no administrator the city of lincoln of course has an administrator 
you, you have the mayor, you have department directors. I mean, there are a lot of things that come across my desk that I sign as the director of the law department. The JPA has no directors, it has no administrator, and so anything that is changed or approved must come before the JPA board. But I'm saying at that meeting, on behalf of the city, the mayor said his capacity allowed him to approve it on behalf of the city. I was at that meeting, I don't recall him ever saying that. The witnesses at the meeting said that, so. I, I just think there's, and, and the fact we don't even have the report, so I mean, it's, this is, a, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars over a quarter of a million dollars. So. These types of reports you don't generally see. We don't link them because they're confidential. Well, it was in the newspaper. Other comments? We have a motion by Councilman Camp and a second by Councilman Woman Lamb to remove the item from the agenda. Hearing no other conversation, would you call the roll, please? Kayla Baird? No. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? No. Shob? No. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? No. Motion lost two to four. All right, next then are consent agenda items we can vote on. Items 1A through C were introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Carl and a second by Jane. Is there a discussion? Please call the roll. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Items 1D and 2A through D were introduced by Gaylor Baird. So moved. Second. M motion by Leary and second by Carl. Any conversation? Discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Next then are public hearing liquor resolutions. Those giving testimony are asked to come forward Raise their right hand for the clerk to administer the oath. After the oath, witnesses shall state their names and addresses. I will call item 4A, manager application of Bradley Coza for Walmart, number 3823 at 3400 North 85th Street. Hi, Want to raise your right hand? Yes. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you rarely believe it to be? Yes. Thank you. Just state your name and address. I'm Bradley John Coza, um, 9410 Colby Street here in Lincoln. Good afternoon, Mr. Coza. Thanks for coming. Tell us about your application a little bit. Why are you here today? I'm the recently moved to uh, Lincoln, uh, to the Walmart store here in Lincoln on 84th Street and going for a liquor license in that area. So you'll be, are there other questions before I start? Uh, Bad boy. Yes, thank you. Yes. Welcome to Lincoln, and thank in you. particular, welcome to Northeast Lincoln. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to be here. <laughs> Carl. And yes. well, not only welcome, but welcome back. Yes. Because you were here previously. <laughs> I was, <laughs> thank 25 you. years ago. <laughs> wow. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Teresa, would you read the next item? Yes, next is item 4B, application of GNS Corporation doing business as Discount City for an additional area measuring approximately 60 feet by 29 feet at 5560 South 48th Street. Good afternoon, council members. Do you solemnly <laughs> swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? I do. Thank you. Please My state your name and address. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My, <laughs> my name is Bill Austin. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Blake Austin Law here in Lincoln, 301 South 13th Street, Suite 101, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68508. And I'll be short and to the point. We are here withdrawing our application. It is unnecessary. I, hopefully you received the letter that I sent on May 17th. I will first of all apologize for our not having been here on, I believe, the 10th. We simply didn't realize that this was on the agenda, so we do apologize for that. However, uh, in looking into it, this was something that was filed BC, that is before council uh, was involved, legal council, and uh, <laughs> this was uh, an unnecessary application. The, the 29 by 60 foot uh, space had already been approved for the Class C license in May of 2017, so we ask that you just indefinitely postpone this item if you would so you're not withdrawing 
I'll, I'll, lead, I'll do whichever you guys prefer. It would be withdraw. 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 Okay. Can I withdraw? We'll withdraw it. Thank you. Is anyone else here to speak on this item? Mr. Chair, I move approval of item 4A. Second. A motion by John, second by Carl. Any discussion? Teresa, would you call the roll, please? On 4A. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Yeah. Motion carried 6 to 0. And Mr. Chair, I'd make a motion to withdraw item 4B. Second. We have a motion by John, second by Jane to withdraw item 4B. Any discussion? Would you call the roll, please? Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 6 to 0. Next, then, are public hearing resolutions. I'll call item 5A, accepting a report of new and pending claims against the city for May 1st through the 15th, 2018. Does anyone wish to come forward on this item? All right, if not, I'll call 5B, reappointing Jeff Kirkpatrick as the city attorney for a two-year term effective June 15th, 2018. Good afternoon, Denise Pierce with Mayor Beitler's office. Happy to be here this afternoon. City attorney is one of those unique director positions that requires regular reappointment by mayor and then approval by the city council. Uh, in this case, every two years by charter. I believe it's by charter. Uh, Mr. Kirkpatrick was appointed for the first time in May of 2014. He was reappointed and approved by the council in June of 2016, and he is now up again for appointment and approval. The administration is very pleased to put forward his name again for appointment and would ask for your approval. Thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. We'll do it at this time or we wait till the end? Uh, we'll wait till the end. Okay. Um, next then would be item 5C, special permit 1989C, application of MBH Land Holdings, LLC, and Sun Holdings, LLC, for an amendment to special permit 1989B to expand the boundaries and a waiver to redu reduce an internal setback to zero feet on property generally located at South 27th and Kendra Lane. Anyone here to speak on this item? Jeremy Williams with Design Associates of Lincoln, 1609 N Street. Uh, just here on behalf of the applicant, be happy to answer any questions. Question? Yes, please. Do you have any images of the layout for the site that you could share with us? I don't know who's running the cam today. So the expansion is to, the, the previous permit included these one, two, three, four parcels, and we're expanding it to include this one. The setbacks that are being reduced to zero are the common ones in between these two, which are under common ownership. That's right. Yep. Confirm that it's the yep. same owner. Yep. Thank you. Other questions? Hearing none, is there anyone else in the audience here to speak on this item? Thank you. All right, next I'll call items 5D and E. They are approving a contract between the city and Schneider Electric for the streetlight LED conversion project and amending the fiscal year 1718 CIP to authorize and appropriate $12,500,000 in other financing funds for the LED streetlight conversion project. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, fellow council members. I'm John Carlson, and I'm part of the team that's been working on the LED rapid conversion project for the remaining streetlights here in Lincoln. I'm here today with the rest of the team. Uh, Frank Ularek, who's the city sustainability coordinator. We've got Peter Hinkle and Dan Mossman from Schneider Electric. We've got Chris Connolly, chief assistant attorney, and Brian Kaufman, our finance director, is here also available to answer questions. Um, I know there's been some back and forth and some good discussion, some email back and forth that's gone on. I've kind of put together this Q&A, which I, I emailed you, and hopefully you've had a chance to take a look over, but I thought I'd just briefly run through it just for the benefit of the folks in the audience and anybody watching at home and talk about some of the questions that have arisen and why we continue to think that this is a good project for Lincoln. Um, and I'll start off basically by saying again that, so this is, we have about 31,000 streetlights here in Lincoln, and in 2016, 
uh, the council, the city made the decision to begin converting those over to LED technology. Currently, there's metal halide, there's high pressure sodium, there's mercury vapor, there's some other different older technologies that currently are out in the field right now. We've, since 2016, we've been converting these over as they fail or as new neighborhoods come in at the rate of about 1,350 of them per year. So currently, out in the field now, I think we called this morning, LES told us we have about 4,300, 4,300 LED lights right out and out of the universe of 31,000. So our proposition that we've been working on for about a year now is that we think that LED is the proven technology. The city's already made the decision that when they fail and when new neighborhoods come in, they should be replaced with LED lighting. So that's not the question. The question becomes, at what rate do we want to have these installed? Do we want to continue to install them 1,350 every year on what is essentially a 20-year schedule? Or do we want to advance that as we believe and take advantage of the improvements in safety, the lower energy costs, and the benefits to the environment? And as part of that, it becomes a question then of if you want to do it rapidly, which is we believe we should, how do you want to do that? Well, it brings go back to the, the notion of an energy savings company or an ESCO. And you visited this a month or so ago with the ESCO resolution. As you know, ESCO is a broad term. You can create an energy savings contract in literally thousands of different ways. We tried to work hard to find the one for this particular project on these street lights that works best for Lincoln. The package we've put together here, we think combines what otherwise might be four or five separate contracts into one. You've got the energy audit, the energy and design, procurement, construction, commissioning. We think using the ESCO under the guaranteed contract, it's faster, it's less expensive. You get the bulk pricing. It creates a single point of contact for any questions and accountability. ESCOs were created by state law for exactly these kinds of projects to allow you to create the project that works best for you, to pick the tools that work best for you. They're allowed under the city rules and the charter. They're called out in the comprehensive plan and in the Lincoln Environmental Action Plan as a tool to consider and specifically mentioned as something to consider for streetlights. So we think it's a great tool to use for this particular kind of project. We've created in kind of our own Lincoln way, our contract in kind of our own Lincoln way, um, we propose to use internal financing, which Brandon will come up and talk about a little bit in here in just a little bit. Um, we've created this contract with Schneider to do an install in about 12 months to convert the rest of the streetlights with the guaranteed pricing, the guaranteed engineering. And we've uh, had them do the engineering analysis to show us what the payback is if we take advantage of those energy and maintenance savings and we use the third funding stream of the money that we've already committed to replace the streetlights as they fail for the payback. Next question someone asked, why not have the contract for the energy savings guaranteed longer than one year? So with an ESCO, you can contract with the company that they can guarantee that your savings will continue on for any number of years. With streetlights though, it's a pretty straightforward calculation. It's important to have it guaranteed for the first year. We want them installed, we want them spun up, we want them, which is I say commissioned, we want them commissioned, we want them to be able to analyze and prove to us that they're operating as they're supposed to, that the proper technology, also in the year, any failures, I have 27,000, we're gonna get a couple that come from the factory that may not work, we'll, we're able to replace those. After that first year though, the system is up and operating. You can calculate that that light bulb, that LED fixture is drawing the power that it said it would be. So after that first year, really the only variable, the lights themselves won't vary. They'll continue to draw power as they draw for their life cycle. The only variable then becomes what's the energy rate that you use in order to pay for the power that you draw. Well, in, in our consideration, LES is a great company. LES is a great company with a proven record. They set those rates in consultation with this body and with approval of this body. And so really what it boils down to is we didn't seem like it made any sense to spend money to have a third party guarantee that after the first year, we won't drastically raise rates on ourselves. We think that we have that in our control. We have that in our purview to, 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 to have control over that. Someone asked, why not continue to phase them in over 20 years? I kind of brushed, brushed up against that already. We think this is a proven technology. It's already approved. We've got over 4,000 of these out in the field. We don't hear complaints. People don't, don't have a problem with them. As a matter of fact, they like them. They like these, the better color clarity. They like the better vision. It's better for drivers. It's better for pedestrians. It's better for bicyclists. Um, we have a way that's outlined, we think, that makes sense to rapidly finish that conversion. And we say that now is the time to take advantage of that. We don't see any reason to wait to get the benefits of the safety, the lower energy costs, and the environmental improvements. <coughs> Someone asked, what if energy rates go up in the future? As I said before, I think LES is a, great, is a great company. They demonstrate 
company, agency, I'm not sure what to call them, public power. They do a great job. They have a, they're very, very focused on rates, as you know. That's their primary consideration is to try and keep rates low here in town, and they've demonstrated their ability to do that. But consider this. Even if there were an unforeseen circumstance that raised rates above with the 2.5% escalator that's in there, even if there was an unforeseen circumstance, that's going to happen whether or not we've converted over to energy saving bulbs or not. Converting to LED actually is a hedge against unforeseen circumstances. If rates go up higher than we expect them, don't we want to have LED lights in the field using one third, 35, 40% of the energy that our current bulbs are using? We think that's a hedge. We think it makes sense to put them in now. It's a protection against unanticipated energy increases. I've got two on the back here that talks about financial impact and the interest. I'm going to skip those and let Brandon talk directly about those. I'll talk a little bit about the what if a better technology comes on. Again, I think Lincoln has done a good job over the history, and, and I'm, a, I'm a homebody. I'm getting older. I've lived here a little while. I think Lincoln continues to do a good job of taking advantage of technologies as they come in and as they're proven. We're, Med we're Midwestern people. We want to be cutting edge to the extent that it makes sense. We think LED is exactly that kind of technology. It's a proven technology. We demonstrated that in 2016 when, we, as a body and as a community, we decided to go ahead and accept this as the technology of the future. We're transferring them over now. All we're saying now is it's proven. Let's take advantage of this technology. Let's do it now in the 12 months that are provided. Other people say, let's wait 20 years. Let's wait 10 years. Is there some super technology around the corner? Frankly, you could always say that. But the fact of the matter is LED is here now. It's proven. We've adopted it as a technology. We say, let's install the rest of the lights. And the last question that I have on my particular sheet, and obviously you'll have other questions you want to ask, but the one I want to touch on is people ask if there were negative impacts from the color or the brightness of the LED lights. And Frank sent you some materials that, that, are, that were originated by LES back in the 2016 discussion because that was a question people had when we adopted LED as the, as the conversion technology. And the fact of the matter is that the studies show that there are not negatives, negative effects from the LED technology. The safety effects, obviously, are from the better color clarity and the better vision are an improvement for Lincoln. Um, thousands of street lights, as I said before, have already been converted to LED technology and we're not getting complaints about them from people out in the field. So we think it's a great technology. We think it makes sense to take advantage of that switch now and provide those benefits to the community. If it's okay, I want to ask Brandon to come up and talk about the, the financing part a little bit. Yes, yes please. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, um, so just I want to give a general overview of the financing that we're recommending. So when we're approaching this project, we're looking at three ways primarily to, to fund something like this. You can, one, pay for cash. You can, two, look at an internal financing. Or you can, three, look at some type of debt issuance. And that debt issuance could have been uh, COPS. It could have been um, through the ESCO as well. Um, but it came down to a recommendation of internal borrowing of funds. And so to walk you through why, I guess, is, you know, from a debt borrowing perspective, if we we're going to go out to the market, we're going to have costs associated with going out in the market through paying our FA, paying, paying for a rating, paying for bond counsel. So if that was about a percent and a half of the total, that's about 183000 So off the one-time cost, we're saving 183000 off the bat by internal financing. Um, you know, typically also, you know, we, we invest these funds on a normal basis. Um, and those funds pay back over time. You know, we keep reserves for lots of reasons. We have legal requirements, prudent financial planning. We have bond ratings that we have to uh, keep reserves around for. Uh, cash flow purposes, saving for projects to pay out long-term liabilities like work comp injuries and losses and, and most importantly emergencies. So we keep reserves for a multitude of reasons. Um, so we uh, internally ongoing finance or invest those for a rate of return. Um, so in this case, instead of investing it in US treasuries or US agencies, we're recommending using that as basically internal investment um, for a project that is going to pay itself back over time. Um, this won't be kept off the books in any way. 
This is all booked uh, according to accounting procedures. So the general fund would have a liability moving forward and the funds that would be on the receiving end would book that as an investment asset. Um, there has been past practice in doing this. Um, the city in 2004, 2005 borrowed approximately $17.6 million uh, to purchase the system at the time from LES. So that internal borrowing was structured over a 10 year period. Um, you know, from an investment standpoint, you know, we regularly manage the funds for the city. And we look at three primary things. The first thing we look at always is safety of capital. So from a safety of capital standpoint, we're borrowing from ourselves. We have a higher rating than the US, United States government. We have a triple A. Uh, I think S&P has the United States government at a double A plus right now. So we're higher rated than the, so, you know, our capital is safe. Uh, second, we always look at is cash availability. Um, right now, I looked at the April reports where we had somewhere north of, or about $440 million in cash available. Um, so as a percent of the total right now, we've got about 10 million, or, 10 million invested in internal borrowing structures. That's about 2% of that total. So by moving up to and um, borrowing an additional 12.2 million, that bumped that up to 5%. So it, we're not putting a, a huge amount of the portfolio into that. And in fact, with anything, it's a diver, diversifying the portfolio a little bit more than heavily investing in government, US government agencies and treasuries. Um, you know, from a risk person, and sorry, the third thing, return on investment. So we, when we started this discussion, we set that rate at 2.5, which we thought was an adequate return on investment for the city. Our current uh, investments are about 1.7%. If you look at the 10-year um, treasury today, it's 2.8, but it's been trending down lately. So I think we're in the ballpark from an adequate investment perspective. Um, from a risk perspective, um, as John mentioned, we know that LED is a known quantity. Um, it's, so we have a quantifiable risk. Um, so it's cheaper than going to market. Um, and by structuring this internal investment, there is past practice for doing so. And that's why I stand before you today recommending this internal financing structure. Carl. Thank you. Um, and then John. Brandon, could you talk about the, the payment schedule, how we'll be paying those funds back, and where, where does that money come from? Okay. Um, so the payment schedule, uh, we had structured the repayment, I think, over a 12-year period. Um, so funds would be, and I can't stand here today and tell you which funds we're going to borrow from um, because we got to look at it at a cash availability standpoint, which we're going to have to look at that in the future to know what that cash is. We don't want to do anything that's going to impact our bond ratings. We don't want to do anything that's going to impact cash availability from a financing a project's perspective. Um, so, for example, um, if we took borrowed some money from the self-insurance reserves, uh, the street construction fund, um, you know, there's a whole host of funds out there. Then over time, as this project was implemented, the energy and savings amounts would decrease in the general fund, but we would leave that budgetary amount flat or slightly increasing over time. Um, and then instead of paying LES, the funds, the savings that would be captured would then go back to repay the other funds. Thank you. John? Yeah. First, I just want to say broadly, I, I favor LED lights. I just have some concerns about going at it all in one year. And by the way, I just checked 10-year treasuries are 2.92%, so that's okay. a few basis points higher, and they have been over 3%, and the Fed's uh, apparently going to be low inter, in, increasing our interest rates this week. And so going with 2.5% is one of my concerns on that. Um, we're taking out here a lot of 10-year projections on elements. And I think as you testified at a prior hearing when I asked you the question, 
if something goes wrong here, ultimately the taxpayers are at risk. Uh, we only have the one year energy savings that's projected on a number of finite percentages, but what happens in practice can change substantially. Is that a fair statement? I mean, yes, that is, in the end, if the savings were substantially off, uh, the general fund would have to repay those funds to the other funds that were borrowed from. But you have to calculate, too, the universe of what could go wrong. I mean, if you invest in United States securities, I guess something could go wrong. So if it's something a, happens to U.S. securities, everything's gone. Right. Yeah. So, so the, the I'm point, not too worried about so that. I'm with you. I'm just trying to, to make sure people understand that, 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 you, that you're measuring the risk against the things that, that Brandon talked about, which is the payback and the, and the maintenance savings. Well, if you want to get into that, your savings are about 300, 200 and some thousand a year. We're only paying 900,000 plus in energy right now, so that's not even giving credit for the total two-thirds energy that you're talking about. If you, you, know, you say LEDs were where we're at, I mean, they've just added dimmers to LED lights, which I don't think are here, or once we go to solar power like China is doing, so we don't have any energy cost, or we minimize it even more. Yeah. And you say, well, we can do it, just adapt and plug it in. Well, I, I've given you personal situations where the city has bought the ability to use credit cards on the parking meters. That software went was obsolete a few years later, so we had to buy all new head meters, all new right. parking meters. So, uh, And as I've said to you, I'm going to propose we do this over five years. Replace them all, but do it 20% a year. That way, as there are some changes in technology, you know, we get some advantage. Rates are or the costs of equipment, hard things. And I, well, I want to ask questions at this point, I, but I, I mean, just talk about it because uh, in your presentation, yes, things have come down. I mean, LEDs were coming down 30 to 40 percent a year for many years. Now they're coming down 10 to 15 percent a year. So we have opportunities to save there, plus getting new technology in, in just a short period. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah, you know, and, and specifically to that though, we think we fit kind of a sweet spot. I mean, at some point, you know, you got to you got to make the move. I mean, we're purchasing no, streetlights. No, we don't lights. have to make. Them. You're asking us to make the move. Well, that, but we are purchasing streetlights. The question is, are we purchasing 1,350 of them every year, or are we going to purchase them in quantity right now? Is there a chance that they could go down slightly, and we may have missed an opportunity to wait around and have them? There might be, but we also would have missed all those energy savings over that time too. So you're right. It's a, it's always a calculation. Everything that that the council does is always a calculation. Let's do it 20% a year. Let's do over five years. Yeah. In our estimation, the numbers show that it's better to do it. But you're projecting 10 years out, and you're telling us what's in that crystal ball. Well, we're telling you what a light bulb draws in power, and we're telling you what LES typically does in rates, and we're saying that we're able to do that calculation and show the payback and use those paybacks, those savings, in order to basically pay our savings back. But the maintenance is what you consider to be the large part of the savings, and LES maintenance costs have gone up substantially. Mm -hmm. And they're still going to have to check out the longevity of a power pole. They're going to have to check out the longevity of the drivers. The drivers in right. LED fixtures last 10 to maybe 15 years. So you're probably going to just replace the whole head. Right. You don't go out and have your microwave replaced. Right. I mean, how old's your cell phone? Well, this is specifically to the poles and the wiring. The poles and the wiring aren't included in the calculation. So the maintenance calculation is only applicable to the fixture. So there'll always continue to be pull charges and wiring charges no matter what fixtures on there. So the fix so the savings, maintenance savings is only applicable to the fixture. So that works regardless of poles and wiring. You're saying you're gonna get four hundred and eighty five thousand savings and maintenance? Definitely. Yep. That's based on LES's maintenance rates that they've given us. Have you talked to the CFO at LES? Have I talked to Kevin Wales? No, CFO, the the financial officer in the, that department on rates. Have I talked to them? Have you gone? You've talked to the engineers at LES. Sure. I know that, but as far as the internal financing department and and all at LES, right? My understanding is you haven't talked to them about this. No, we haven't talked to them about the financing. No. Well, I'm talking about the rates and how the structure will be in future increases for maintenance and right. equipment. We've talked with their engineers about the rates and their anticipated and projected rates, and that's how we got our payback calculations. But we haven't talked to them about the contract or the financing because we figure that's. That's I'll a purview of the city council. Later. Thank you. Frank Ularic, uh, Mayor's Office. Uh, Emily Koenig, uh, Director of Budgets, participated in, and helped us structure the, the estimates for which this project is based upon. Right. So we had both their financial people and their engineering folks at the table developing these, these estimates and assumptions. Yeah, all, of our technical all of our technical projections are based on LES's data. Right. Have you talked to her boss? Laura? She's not been directly involved in these conversations. 
Emily has all the, the authority and know how. I think to. Kevin Wales sent you this graph that I requested from LAS mm -hmm. for the last right. five years. Right. And you've seen how the maintenance has gone up substantially, and we've had some decline in energy costs down to 978,000. Right. And if you're talking about this two thirds savings mm -hmm. on the LEDs, I mean, two thirds would knock that down to three, 400,000, and you're only taking down a smaller amount, which actually helps your argument to replace them all now. Right. But just the, the continued advances in this and being able to do it as we go. You know, two years ago we did decide we want to go to LEDs. It's just not to do it at all one fell swoop. Yeah, I hear you. We just think the numbers make it show that it makes sense to do it within 12 months instead of 60. So technology you're banking on for 25 years, I've heard you say, Frank. I mean, do you think there's an electric company today that makes a production run for 25 years on a light bulb? I, I'm not sure I could answer that. Well, I mean, I, do, would, a, would Microsoft or, or Intel make a computer chip run for more than two years? Likely not. Okay. So I, I well, think what we need to see, it, we're living in a totally different world of throwaway things. No. I doubt very few of not us Not at all. Not with, not with LEDs. Uh, LAS has seen more and more. Years. LAS has seen more and more data that supports that the, the LEDs can go even beyond 25 years. And I believe Je uh, Jeff Lovich shared that with you. I'm not saying they can't last, but you get into really solar powered and all the savings totally there. The new generations, we have new generations of microchips and so forth. I'm just saying, let's try five years and see if we don't get some more advantages as far as taking advantage of new improvements rather than say we're betting on this 25 years because I don't when you look at the opportunity costs of, of phasing that in five years you know on a, on a 10 year basis we're going to be out six million in the energy and maintenance savings that were calculated with this project so five years you cut that in half probably three million that you're missing out on on immediate energy Phase and maintenance it in, savings. so the last year only be 20 percent but think of the advantage that we can take the excitement of getting a new technology or refined technology on LEDs that's even better you're giving up that opportunity and you're saying we're going to make everything now and then it'll be obsolete altogether. Well, we're, we're uh, as, as much as LEDs have improved, we're, we're hearing and seeing that the, uh, to get any more incremental improvements out of LED technology, we're likely not going to see it in, on any grand scale. We're, Are we're these nearing, dimmable? Pardon? Are these dimmable? Are these dimmable that we are installing? They say yes. They will have the capability to be dimmable, you bet. Are they wired to be dimmable? They're standard. That is the standard LES uh, uh, design specification that they come with the seven pin connector that makes them dimmable. And that is not a significant added cost to have them ready for that technology. Are they dimmable just by the light, daylight? I mean, there are not other ways to dim them down? Say you, from you have to have a night. control system added to dimmable, but we haven't seen just yet the, the financial justification for going with a control system, but uh, having them dimmable ready was the, the wise thing to do at this point. Well, I think you're seeing that happen and some other cities have gone back and already replaced their LEDs to get that ability to dim them at various times of the night. So That's why we're not going to have to because they'll be dimmable ready when we install them. The control system is a whole different add-on and substantial cost. That, that's my point. Maybe it won't be a substantial cost as this technology can. Anyway, I think my point's being made. I, I just think if we did, we slowed this down to five, well, it's not even slowing it down. It's just do five years, replace right. them all, so we get the opportunity for some future advances, and at the same time, we get those savings fairly quickly. Uh, I, I don't see the, the advantage in a five-year delay. In fact, you're missing some opportunity costs in that time frame. Other questions? I did. I have some questions. Thank you. Um, John, could you just give me again the, the um, payback that added to the million or so a year? You s yep. Sure. It's the three components that we have, the energy savings, the maintenance savings, and then the existing conversion failure budget should pop up so that energy savings be 375,000, just rounding, 495,000 for the maintenance savings, and a little over 306,000 for the existing conversion failure budget. That's the analysis that Schneider has done for us that shows the $1.17 million funding stream available then to pay back the $12.2 million back to the internal savings account in essence that we have. So, um, 
Okay, so I had a question because I was looking at the statute that authorizes the ESCOs, and um, my primary concern is internal borrowing. But also, as I looked at the uh, the ESCO, it indicated that you could compute savings that were energy and savings from the uh, the operation and maintenance, which is the 485, okay? This other 306 at our last hearing, um, that's not really savings and it's not a new revenue stream. Nope. And so I'm not sure that this actually fits into the statutory model. So I have some concerns and I may talk with, uh, with law about that maybe. That's fine, Chris can get up. No. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and also, <laughs> And I know we want to have the public hearing too, so I apologize. This is if, exactly if, what we need to do: is get your questions answered. Yeah, if this is, uh, yeah, a, li a little it's not, delayed. It's not a savings; it's a funding. It's the third funding stream to do the payback. Then. Chris Connolly, Chief Assistant City Attorney. Thank you. Uh, we're not limited to just a couple of items here. I mean, the the, the whole purpose of these statutes is to provide uh, a different mechanism for procuring. Uh, and paying for projects that are going to result in en energy savings, and and that's really what the the basis of this agreement of the the statutes is. So, but as I read the statute, it said we could do those are the sources. We could use our energy savings. We could use our maintenance and operating savings that we've already computed, or we could use new revenue sources that were going to be created by the uh, by the ESCO or the project itself. And this isn't really a new energy, it's not a really new, new in revenue stream. So as I read it. I'm, I'm sorry, which section were you referring to? Oh gosh, you, I knew you were gonna ask me that. So 66106 something. Right. <laughs> and I'm trying to find it real quick, so. Um, 62 has, excuse me, 6, yeah, 62 has the definitions yeah, but wonder, I'm not absolutely certain it's in there. I wonder if that's more germane, though, to the if you were doing borrowing from the ESCO itself. I think we probably have great flexibility if we're doing internal financing to identify whatever funding streams this body and the administration find appropriate to repay ourselves. I'm suspecting we have great flexibility to pay ourselves back. I, I So I don't think that's the way the statute's that's, written. I mean, it's written what can be considered uh, savings for purposes of the ESCO contract. So, if, uh, if the contract included the financing with the third party, I wonder. It doesn't it doesn't say that? Okay. So yeah, so um, I do, and I do have some concerns with the uh, internal borrowing. I so I've reached out, and Chris, I wondered if you've reached out because I have reached out to a number of communities, and I haven't, um, and a number of folks that have worked with ESCOs, and I haven't found anyone that's used internal funding, internal borrowing. I have not talked to anyone else that's used internal borrowing. Okay, thank you. I'll find that. Re that. <laughs> but they may not have our AAA bond rating either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, quite frankly, in Nebraska, a lot of these have been used for um, school districts, uh, rural school districts. Mm -hmm. And it's made it a much easier method for them to procure these companies uh, uh, because it, it takes out a lot of the work at the very beginning. It doesn't have to be on a bid process. It's really a request for qualifications. That, that sets it up and allows them to um, sort of streamline the procurement process. But it also acknowledges and re recognizes that, uh, that the ESCO companies can provide uh, the funding mechanism to pay for these improvements that are gonna go in for boilers and, and air conditioners and whatever other equipment that they need. And so that's, that's really where these statutes that came in about 20 years ago, uh, that's, where, that's where it comes from. Mary, you got a question? Yeah, thank you. Well, the public testimony on this item prompted me to do a little nighttime driving recently. And so uh, I went out and observed. I, I asked where we had some installations of LED and so saw what it looks like on arterials. You are right, like moonlight, moonlight, really visible, pretty high installation, um, seemed like a real improvement. I saw some residential installations on the edge where you know, it also seemed like a real improvement uh, in terms of visibility and glare, uh, no, no additional glare. But what I did notice in core neighborhoods where we have telephone pole-like street lamps was that the brightness was noticeable and much more significant than the existing mm -hmm. lights that we have. So what I was hoping you could talk to us about is 
what the rollout plan is and how we might be able to make modifications so that the lighting is appropriate for some of the older residential neighborhoods as we begin to roll out LEDs. Because um, I think what's currently being installed uh, could, could potentially be seen as problematic when it's done in a more complete fashion. It is very bright and very close to the ground. Right. So are there other, my questions really aren't with ESCOs, it's about yeah. design standards Product. for lighting. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because you and I, you know, I'm, I'm an older neighborhood person too, so I'm kind of, had done the research that too, and we talked to Schneider about, and to LES about what's in the, kind of the current streetlight portfolio right now, particular to, to older neighborhoods. So you're right. So you're basically trying to say, what's what do we have right now in terms of locations that does is kind of the mass star mount instead of the older neighborhood that has the kind of the pole top mount. And they got back to Frank and I today, and they said they had about 579. So out of 27,000, about 579 in older neighborhoods that I think are the kind that you're that you're most interested in. So the I think in, in answer to your question, the rollout over the 12 month rollout, I've talked to Schneider a little bit too. I think there's plenty of time during the procurement and the rollout to potentially look to see if there's an alternate fixture for those particular locations, those 579 fixtures, to see if there's a particular lens or a particular edge shielding that might take accomplish what it is that you're talking about. In I the newer neighborhoods, about. there's like a glass fixture around the bulbs. In right. the older neighborhoods, you can see all the individual bulbs and the, yep. the glare is, you can't, you can't look at it. Yep. You have to look away. So I think that would be, I'd like to understand the process to, yep. what kind of modifications are possible I realize you've spec'd out the city. Right. If we want to make a different specification for a particular set of poles, what, what is that process and can you bring it back to us? Yeah, I, we can commit to that. We can commit to finding an alternative fixture that accomplishes what it is that you want to do for those particular locations. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Yes. Chair, if I can, Cindy, I, I'm wondering if you were referring to 66-1065-1B it talks about the contract uh, shall set forth the calculated energy, utility, wastewater, or water cost savings or revenue enhancements, if applicable, during the contract period uh, attributable to the energy conserva conservation measures to be installed. Operational or capital savings or revenue enhancements, enhancements may be included in the total savings amount, amount not guaranteed but approved by the governmental unit. Um, is that the section you're referring to? That sounds close to it, but it doesn't sound exactly what I read. I haven't found exactly okay. what I read. Yeah. And I'm sorry, you said that was, I know it's, I'm on 66 right now. So you said 66 1B? Uh, 66 10 65 1B. Okay, thank you. Other comments from the council? I'll ask Schneider. Yeah. Does anyone in the audience like to testify at this point? Hi, my name is Mary Quintero. I live at 6421 Monticello Drive in Lincoln. And I emailed each of you um, information earlier today. I'm, I'm sorry it was in response to information you received Friday afternoon. So uh, I wish I could have gotten it to you sooner. But um, I do have extra copies for everyone, um, if I may. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then I separated. Um, if you recall, la at the last hearing, we were told that the um, American Medical Association guidelines had been debunked. So I had to research that a little further, and I researched some of the documentation you were provided. And um, no, to this day, in 2018, they are still referred to, um, and there is concern exactly about what you were describing. And even in the paperwork that you received last Friday, and this is just another, can I reach you one more time? I'm so sorry. That's a separate document that you might want to read when you have time. Um, I do want to start, though, by saying um, our family made a decision to move to Lincoln after searching for nine years as to where we wanted to live. Thank you. Uh, it was the best decision we ever made, and there hasn't been a moment in the 17 years we've lived here that we have not loved living in Lincoln. Um, it's just a great place to live. So my concern is this wholesale change in every single residential street that we live on, not just the older neighborhoods. My neighborhood was built in 1984, so you might not think of that, or 83, as an older neighborhood. But the one fixture that's down the street 
um, that has changed to the 4,000 Kelvin LEDs um, changes the look and the feel in the evening of, of the entire space that it hunkers down on. Um, it, 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 is, it is unattractive. It is too bright. Um, but the good news in researching all of this is I found I am so not alone. <laughs> um, there, there are problems in so many cities, um, and I've documented them for you. But I think I see where the problem has come for Lincoln. And the good news, again, like it was two weeks ago, is we're at the beginning of this, not at the end. So we can fix it um, as far as the bright lights. So in 2016, by 2016, the Department of Energy and all these other cities that were switching over to LEDs, they had started at 6,000. Whoa, 5,100 out of the question. So by 2016, they had settled at that 4,000 Kelvin, which tells you um, the, the light warmth. Um, 4,000 is white. It's described as glaring. It's described as unforgiving. It's just not attractive at all. But that's where they got to. So in 2016, as you saw from the documents you got, the Department of Energy was talking in terms of the 4,000 Kelvin. But in 2018, Two years later, um, you're finding everybody kind of waking up to the fact that that's still too bright for residential areas. And I'd like to propose to you that this current contract calls for 4,000 Kelvin on every street. Now, that's not what we do now. We have residential lighting, and we have commercial lighting that's brighter and, and designed for arterial streets. So what they're proposing is to give us the same commercial lighting for my street, that cul-de-sac, that little street that we have for 27th Street with those, they have two layers of lighting on 27th. But you see what I'm saying? We're using the same 4,000 Kelvin for every single street, and I think we can be smarter than that. Um, so in looking at it further, I do want to thank LES. I, I'm a big fan of our city government, so I'm uncomfortable appearing to criticize, and I'm not. What I want to do is I want to encourage and inspire Schneider Electric to please take me into consideration and, and the other people. But the information is, is readily available. And what I did for you, since there's so much to read, is at what I sent to you and what I've given you out today, I bolded and underlined like I did two weeks ago so that you can see. So Phoenix, Arizona is a good example. You had the UC Davis, uh, sorry, Davis, California last year. They jumped the gun and were way too early adapters and had to change every single street bulb. One minute. Um, thank you. Um, Phoenix um, got on top of it, and um, they have an update in there from February 2018. Um, just to read, the 4,000 Kelvin LED lights were too bright. The public hated them. They were compared to floodlights at a prison. The city found a compromise, eco-friendly LED lights, lower intensity, 2,700 Kelvin. That is what you will find on the last page that I sent you that the Department of Energy is now talking about. They, they walk you through the history. They take you to 2016, which I think is where Lincoln has just stopped at the 4,000 Kelvin. But for residential, you really want to consider 2,700. And that's not just in the older neighborhoods. Please, don't forget us. <laughs> um, any residential street that's primarily residential um, really deserves the 2,700 um, Kelvin, please. And then you'll see with that second handout that I sent you, it just simply highlights um, the glare problems. Um, and as you described, you cannot look straight up at the lights. Um, you, 10 seconds, you will call us retinal damage. <laughs> so let's not. <laughs> anyway, all right. Thank you so much. Anyone else would like to speak on this item? I, I'd love for Schneider yes. to come up if you could. Peter Hinkle with Schneider Electric. Thanks again for coming down. And um, you heard my question of city staff just about how the rollout would occur. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to sort of what would be the plan for the year. And would you be starting with arterials? Would there be some time to try and examine, you know, what's not your issue, really our issue, of what design standard we have in place for residential Absolutely. Lighting? I mean, that's the first thing we're going to run with in the next 9 to 12 months is those arterials, those main thoroughfares. That's where the biggest bang for your buck. Uh, mm -hmm. kind of exists, so we want to get those out and start those as soon as possible. To the point that John made, the 579, 580 or so different lights that are out there, 
we're going to work with LAS and try to identify what's the right solution, uh, not just the ones that might already be installed, but also the ones that might be upcoming, and figure out what, from a residential perspective, we can do to hopefully reduce that glare or reduce the brightness of the lights that you're talking about as, as well as, I think, what's been brought up. Um, so really, that's kind of the rollout phase. And we're zoning this so that we can have different zones of the city kind of attack simultaneously. That's what's going to allow us to get this done rather than in a 16-month or a two-year process really kind of allow us from a, a construction management standpoint to be able to roll out as lights come in and be able to attack different zones and knock those out. And, and clearly that will all be communicated with both LES and city staff, and then that can roll out actually to the community um, just in different platforms that we've created. So. In other communities where you've worked, have you had requests to do a different level of Kelvin or a different kind of um, brightness in resi on residential blocks? Yeah, I mean, the hard part is, in, in this case, you know, we're working with LES, and, and it's really the LES design standard that we're, we're addressing. So, uh -huh. you know, as much as we'd love to say, hey, we would change the design standard if it was our choice, mm -hmm. we can't do that. We have to live within what has been adapted and what's been identified, which is a great standard. I mean, the way they created it and the way they keep updating it, I mean, it's not like... It came forth in 2016 and they just forgot about LES or, or excuse me, LED lighting. They have continuously upgraded those, those standards and what their expectations are in terms of light levels within the space. Sounds like John, John can weigh in, I guess, more detail. Just gonna, as you're saying about that, we're just putting on the Elmo here. Basically, the information from LES that we had that we forwarded, which was originally developed in the 2016 um, from, from, from Jet, basically kind of showing the temperature scale here. So. Uh, Oh, sorry. A couple of different things we have to keep in mind is that the Kelvin refers to the color of the light, and that is important. Mm -hmm. But as far as what's used in an arterial and what's used in a residential, the wattage is obviously going to be very different. So in terms of the, the lumens that are produced, so Kelvin is one important thing. The color of the light is one important thing, but the intensity of it and the wattage is another important thing. And as, as we said, 4000K essentially mimics moonlight. You can see it here. It's in the lower third-ish of the spectrum. It's not the harsh white or blue light that people might think in a lumber yard or kind of a thing. It does approach the moonlight, and according to LES, it's been vetted, it's been proven, and it's the chosen standard. So I don't have an issue with the color yeah. at all. You just it want to do some glare. shielding and some. I, you 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 have to look away from the ones that yep. are in residential areas that aren't on the edge. That that the just ones that don't have a address some of the public testimony. I wanted to make sure that people knew. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for being here today, Peter. Um, if we were to have some uh, want something different, for instance, a 2700K for the uh, residential areas, would we expect that that would reduce our cost of installation? Let me ask Dan. Do you have a question? We've got somebody from one of our vendors, a uh, lighting vendor, who could probably give you a better sense of if there's a cost difference. Then I, I, I don't want to pretend like I know every single thing <laughs> on the planet Earth. But. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, folks. My name's John Petty. I'm from Bennington, Nebraska, and I work for Acuity Brands Lighting. The answer is the fixture cost will be the same going to a 2,700 degree or 3,000 degree Kelvin. But the one thing you have to look out for by going from one color temperature going lower is that you're going to reduce the output and uh, for the same amount of wattage and it's called lumens per watt and so you'll actually if you go down to 2700 degree kelvin you're going to have to consider raising the wattage in order to get the same amount of lumens you know that you that les has designated uh, for safety purposes and so that's just one of the considerations there lower the kelvin temperature possibly had to have a higher wattage in order to maintain the same foot candle levels or candela per square meter levels that you're and you put that in terms of in English. Uh, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Of insulation cost. Are we going to cost less? The, Energy the, cost. Are we going to cost it, more? It goes back to the. I think the, the, the comment that he made is the fixture itself is not going to change as far as the, the cost of that fixture. The cost of the fixture based off the color temperature, uh, which our constituent here is you know 2700 degree Kelvin, will be the same price as 4000 degree Kelvin. It's just that we may have to raise the wattage up. Because then when you go to a lower Kelvin temperature, you have less lumens coming out, less lumen output with the lower temperature. Does that and mean it'll increase energy usage? It would, yes. It would, yes. That's what I wanted. John? Thank you. Yes. Welcome. I appreciate you, gentlemen. Go ahead. Um, no particular order here, but I'd ask about the dimmers, and I saw you shaking your head. Can you describe the dimmers? Because as I understand it, our street lights are, are not hooked up to a central meter or anything, that we do just more of a, a daylight 
sensor to dim them down. And what I'm seeing and reading is there are actually physical ways they can dim them on demand. And I believe they're one and of the gentlemen was talking the, about the, controls the, and everything. In the, in the case here of what we've been asked to, and, and some of my fellow competitors have been asked in putting the packages together, all the fixtures are dimmable. They have a purple and gray wire lead in it. It ties back up to the receptacle there. So in the future, if you're putting on a smart controls on there, you can remotely dim the fixtures. And it's on every one of the fixtures that you're going to be purchasing in this in these applications here. So they are dimmable ready. They just make sure that we have that receptacle on top that, you know, you put the old uh, photo cells on. You can change those out to a smart control, and then at that point you can dim. But be careful because sometimes you don't want to dim the fixtures so low that you're below safety levels and uh, i mean it's great that you think that you can dim the fixtures down and save more energy but you've got to make sure that you have the proper foot candle levels on the on the street so you have safety for the public for your bicyclists for your pedestrians as well as the drivers of the car and and john to your point about asking if if you know what we've done and what we've looked at we've vetted this uh with frank where frank is and and the entire city staff as far as looking at the controls and controllability of the system but at this time i think that they weren't ready to move forward with any kind of a control system so the system that we're getting is basically controls ready it's just a matter of the cost, the upfront cost, didn't really justify kind of what they were seeing from a payback perspective, mainly because I think your point is right. Uh, LES is based upon a rate, not a meter. You know, if this was a third-party utility and they had a metered system, for example, well, obviously dimming it, you get a lot better payback. In this case, you're based upon a flat rate, a cost perspective from 4,000 run hours based upon each luminaire, and that's how that savings or that cost is derived not based upon the dimmable or the dimming capabilities of the fixture. However, we wanted to make sure that we're future thinking, not just from dimmable capabilities, but smart cities and all that kind of um, nuance that goes along with using the streetlights for more than just a streetlight, but really looking at them as an asset. And the goal would be, you know, one day hopefully to look at another system um, that could tie into what's already there that would be able to then allow you to have the smart cities capabilities. What are you talking about uh, on the cost of controllers, just out of curiosity, Mr. Mr. Yularic talked about it's very expensive, but I, I yeah. refer to you because you're the equipment man. Well, I mean, you know, and, and again, we, we estimate anywhere from two and a half to up to $5 million for additional cost. Okay. And it's just dependent upon the, the type, the level, you know, some of them are just asset management tools. Other ones go, you know, the full kit and caboodle where you can tie in things like security and things of that nature. But at this present time, and I won't, I won't speak for staff, when we went through this process and vetted all that out, it was just decided that it did not fit into this program at this time because of the added cost and the lack of savings that we could justify for making that investment. Yep, that was in the range that we were quoted by the various vendors and LES's own internal uh, evaluation. But if they're not going to give us a credit for dimming, which would be the, you know, a financial objective of, of a control system, then that's not worth pursuing at this time. But we want to be smart city ready moving forward. Well, I appreciate your saying that. I guess what concerns me is just like your cell phones, it seems like they always change the little way you plug in the charger and everything. And so, and I know with our parking meters here years ago, we got them so they're credit card ready. And then we went to do the credit cards, we had to replace everything because the technology and all had changed so much. And we're in a, a technology era. Uh, and I know we've talked a little bit in the past one-on-one uh, -on, -one on, on technology, but I, when I'm talking to other providers of electronic equipment and lights and so forth they're just saying you, know, you can't bank on 25 years of these lasting that just obsolescence they're not going to go more than 10 12 years that and maybe you could comment on the drivers they're saying that those wear out and as a result it's just not economical to repair the driver which is the as i understand it the led's version of a uh, ballast versus the high pressure sodium and so you just replace the whole thing and that typically goes 10 12 years maybe 15 years and so I'm just trying to look at the practicalities here I'm, I'm full on board with LEDs it's just some of these things can we edge into it 20 percent a year instead of 100 you know, percent in one year and then suddenly be locked in I guess a question to yes. Peter, can you uh, answer what are the warranties on the lamps, what are the warranties on the ballast, what are the warranties on the drivers that the manufacturer guarantees? Yeah, so the majority of the lights have a 10-year warranty. And so what that covers is, you know, the part associated with whatever would fail. Now, John's right. I mean, if a driver fails, they might send out a whole luminaire, but they also might send out a driver. You know, and from a labor perspective, I think we talked about this a little bit last time, 
you're going to pay for that labor aspect no matter what with LES just maintaining those lights and maintaining those luminaires. So really the only thing you might be having to replace if a driver does fail is the driver itself. But I mean, again, it goes back to just like anything else from a warranty perspective. There's a reason why you don't buy a car and have it warrantied for the full life of 200,000 miles. It would cost that car three times what it costs today. And I think Jeff Lavik kind of addressed this question, I believe, in an email um, back to council regarding the lifespan of what he's seeing in luminaires as well as the, as well as the drivers. And then it seemed to me that the, the overall lifespan that he was seeing was beyond the 20, 25 year lifespan, and they weren't really running into a lot of these issues on the lights that they've had installed. How can they see that long? Because LED streetlights have only been out nine years. I'm just going off of what the email said. So I'm, I'm just telling you how, how and what he came it, up with as I, far as I his believe background. It's based on projections of what reduction they're seeing in the output out in the field through the last 10, 15 years that they've been out there. But the driver's a part, not an output. Uh, apparently the, dri the driver failure must be in line with what they're projecting for the LEDs as well. The luminaires. Well, again, uh, they've only been around nine years. Uh, I want to go back. Sir, what was your name again? Uh, John Petty. Uh, to answer your question as far as lifetime of the uh, drivers and working with two of our largest uh, driver uh, manufacturers, they're looking at about a 1% failure rate every 100,000 years. Or hours, excuse me. Okay, Sorry. that's yeah. <laughs> well, that'd be great. <laughs> it takes it pays for there. itself, in. but uh, uh, Commissioner Camp, uh, it's it's burning. we're looking at about a hundred thousand hour lifetime and with a one percent failure rate. Okay, those hours. Okay, well, and then going on to degradation loads, and you talked about when you were talking about twenty seven hundred yeah. versus uh, four thousand Kelvin, you also need to keep a lumen level, a light level, uh, materials and all for safety and yes. so forth. And I, I don't know, who promulgates those safety standards? Uh, well, what IES has the uh, option of, uh, I'm on a committee called the uh, Roadway Lighting Committee, and it's uh, authorized by the uh, Illuminating Engineering Society, and I'm on that committee. I'm chair of the uh, Residential Street Light Committee for that. So my committee, we make recommended practice suggestions for light levels, and it's based off of how, how many cars are on a road. So you have a local road, um, you know, a uh, collector road, and then the ar major arterial road. Uh, and we have different light levels for that. And then we also figure in the amount of pedestrian traffic. And with those two combined together, we can up with a foot candle level or a candela per square meter level. And it's up to LES to accept that, or they can come up with their own standard, because all we do is a recommended practice in, in that application. Now, I think in some of the material, maybe John Carlson, that you presented to us, there was something about Lincoln only does a set, drops down 30% below what your committee recommends. Did I re We've gotten so much here in the last two hours or three <laughs> hours. I, I, I can't speak for what Jeff and, and LES does on I that. So. Again, I think Jeff was trying to describe how LES sets their current standard. Um, but I think what's important is that what we're ordering and what we're talking about installing meets the LES standard, meets the community standard that they've set. Well, what I wanted to follow up with Mr. Petty was uh, when I did some research with some manufacturers, they were saying that the, there's a degradation level, that over time the LES, because uh, I may have misunderstood testifiers before, they said, well, it just increases over time. And they said, no, there's a degradation level. And they said that there's a 30% degradation in an LED over 50,000 hours of use, which is 11.42 years. And with that's what I was quoted anyway. And what they said was, they said, you know, salespeople go out and talk about this 100,000 hours, but they said, in reality, that's what you're gonna have, is that's when it's going to degrade to a level intensity that's below the standards you need for street arterials. So regardless of the fact it's operating fine, you need to replace it because you don't have the light lumens that you need. That's, that's a great great point. Uh, I got a couple questions. Well, let me answer. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 answer your please question. Think, yes. when, we do, when we work with Jeff and LES to come up with, with you know, desired foot candles, what we build in to is a, what they call a light loss factor. We just don't take it straight out of the box and light it right to levels there. In the case with, uh, you know, when we do streets here and be at the city of Chicago, I'm, I'm the person who worked on the city of Phoenix and, oh, okay. uh, and the city of Tucson here. Uh, what we do is we figure in that light loss factor to 100,000 hours, and that is uh, dirt depreciation built in, you know, how much dirt gets onto the fixture. That's, that's a part of it, but also the degradation of the LED. So when we do a design, we're doing it 
100,000 hours out. So we're actually over lighting the road here. But as over time, as you have depreciation from dirt and from the LED, uh, at, by the end of life at 100,000 hours, you have the proper foot candle level at that time. So we, we account for that. It's a, it's a standard practice within the industry. And I think it goes back to the whole point of, of us following the LES standards. You know, they've, they've done this now for several years, both from an implementation standpoint, but also updated these, working with different vendors across, uh, you know, not just Acuity, but Philips and Sylvania. I mean, GE kind of named the brands. They've had conversations and dealt with each one of them to help come up with what is the appropriate standard for LES based upon your specific set of lights that are out in the space today. And we just didn't do it for uh, LED. We did this for the old high-pressure sodiums, the orange lights that you folks have out there. Same practice. We use that same depreciation and, and figuring that out, too. How does that affect what my colleague and, uh, yes, Baylor, sir. Uh, Baylor, Baylor said on the residential? If you're over-lighting to get it there, so it'll last that 100,000 hours, then aren't you making more light in the residential areas? Than any area? To, uh, for... Uh, uh, for Councilman uh, Gaylord Bear, we would definitely on those 579 uh, work uh, with it. You know, we've had some feedback from folks in Phoenix and Tucson, hey, this is too bright. And in this case, we would work with Schneider about for house side shields or possibly taking a look at a lower wattage fixture, you know, to address those issues. And it's a case by case basis here. And, and we've, we've always found that, you know, we, we work with the towns and get feedback and, and see what we can do to help improve. Be, be able to make some recommendations that w well, would work with Elliot. When Schneider's past talking about stage. doing, yeah, yeah. When we get to that stage, you know, if we get feedback, we can always take a look at house side shields or uh, we have uh, equipment that we can put in there that actually can manually dim them down. And, uh, and work with it so that your, your particular residents go, yeah, that looks good, you know. And that, that's really kind of part of the whole commissioning aspect of any lighting project. I mean, we don't want to just set it out of the box and forget about it. I mean, there's a lot that goes into, you know, to your point, making sure that the light levels are appropriate for the space. And obviously not just working with one, we've got multiple vendors that we work with on this uh, basis uh, based upon the product that they're providing. And we're going to do that on, you know, essentially every light is making sure that that light level is appropriate, that it's meeting the standards associated with whatever LES is set. But it's also not causing a nuisance. I mean, we don't want it going into someone's front yard or their home uh, that was not taking place beforehand. I think that was so interesting, eye-opening, was to see how, the, how many different kinds of poles and installations there are. And so then the impact of LED is different depending on the the thing it's mounted on, so I appreciate that. So you're saying there is going to be a process by which you will uh, tailor the specifications and work with LES, despite them having standards, they can be modified, correct? With, with myself or any of my competitors, you know, we do all have house side shields, just not us. And uh, we definitely work with Schneider, and uh, you know, when we, if we do run into situations so like whether, that. Whether it's through shielding or whether it's through procurement of a particular fixture that accomplishes that. Is that part of your, this was proposed to us that you'd include that in the cost of doing all that individually? No, that's a part of our project is to make sure that these lights are operable and that they fit into the standard. And if we need to change that standard or work with LES to adjust, you know, it sounds like there's a small portion of these residentials that we need to look at. That's something that we can take care of as a part of this contract. Thank you. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. I feel like I lost a little bit of control here, but I think we had fun. <laughs> first day, right? Yeah, first day. Yeah, first day jitters. Uh, by fire. Yes. Uh, so we talked a little bit about dimmers and that temperature control, and you guys got around there. There are ways to start with that 4,000 and then bring it down. Uh, the answer would be uh, no. You can't, you can't change color temperature down. Okay. There is stuff in the industry. It's mostly for indoor lights like your can lights or something where you can what they call color tunable but it's uh for smaller wattage not for large wattage fixtures that you see out in the out in the field uh, two more uh payback time we talked about 25 year life but our payback was shorter than that wasn't right. it so if we, right sorry let me jump in here right so using those three funding streams that we talked about we have a simple payback of 10.4 years 10.4 yep and after i'm sorry 10.4 right and after we've paid back then the money that we borrowed from ourselves, then those reduced, those energy savings and those maintenance savings just flow back to the rate payers, taxpayers. And then one more, you spoke of an organization that you were, yeah, several well, organizations. It's, it's uh, Illuminating Engineering Society. Illuminating Engineering Society. Yeah, we're a national group uh, and we're practitioners, manufacturers, uh, college 
uh, professors and the like. And, uh, and one of the subcommittees is what they call the Roadway Lighting Committee, and that's what I'm a member of. And so we're responsible for roadways, tunnels, underpasses, parking lots, and parking garages. And that's where we come up with what they call recommended practice, not a standard recommended, recommended. practice. Very enlightened. <laughs> um, I would have used that one. How long have you been waiting for that one? Yes. Are there other good, John? Yes. I, I guess two bigger questions here. Huh. I guess as I've looked at this, it just seems to make kind of a compromise, common sense that we do this over a five year period. And I, that's me picking that out just so we can take some advantage as to changes that are coming. Again, there's only a nine year history on LED lights and we've seen all of these. You gentlemen have been in the industry. I know from your standpoint, it's easier to get in, get her done, get out, you're guaranteed for a year and that's it. Uh, we got a parts warranty, but you know, I had a part in a building the other day replaced. It's $35 part, cost me $250 to replace it. And so we've got that. So I, what if we do this in five years and take sections of the city so we get the light consistency for everybody yeah. I guess I guess our answer <clears throat> is that and again I respect what you're saying but I, I guess for us to take the five years on the chance that there's a breakthrough technology we're weighing that against the certainty that we can get energy savings now the certainty that we can make it safer to drive on our streets right now so I guess our preference is to stay with the original proposal which is to change them out now go with the certainty of the lower energy savings the lower maintenance savings how old are the watches on your hands? What's that? How old's your wristwatch? <laughs> My wife got this for me for, uh, <laughs> let's see, I, I think it was our, our child being born, so it's about a year old. Okay. Wait, she got you a gift? <laughs> well, no, she got a gift. <laughs> don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Trust me. I, uh, <laughs> please, please don't make this. This isn't a public meeting, is it? Uh, <laughs> No, and, and my I, point being, I just don't... I, and John, I understand your concern. I mean, when we did the math and we looked at doing it over five years, and I, I think that we've even, you know, broken down, I think, over 10. I mean, you're talking about an opportunity cost for the city of over $6 million. You know, every week that we have this conversation or that we delay and we wait, it costs the city approximately $20,000, 17000 18000 and change in potential savings for the city. And so when you start to add all that up, you really got to start to think of, What's my ability to get this done today? Now, there's some, you know, some economies of scale by doing it all at once. There's also a look and feel of the city. Which parts of the city are you going to choose? Which kind of broke it down to six zones. How do you determine that? What's the best way to determine that? You know, we have a solution for each one of your lights, minus the 579 that we're going to work on, that's going to provide not only energy savings, but significant maintenance reduction and overall impact of the city from a safety perspective and all the points that John uh, has articulated here today that really makes sense to move forward with this project. And, you know, obviously there's, there's a, a differing of five years versus today, but, you know, when, even when you break down that 10-year breakout that I, I think we, we saw earlier or that uh, was passed over to you guys, you know, that's still $3 million if you shorten it down into a five-year, and I'm just doing simple math, so don't quote me on that. But that's a significant amount of money just in terms of the opportunity to capitalize in today's dollars on these fixtures, on the replacement costs, and the energy maintenance cost savings that allow you to see that today rather than having to wait. The other thing I'll say is, you know, I've worked with cities who have had that kind of mentality. And what happens in year two when, to your point, something happens that needs to be addressed and dollars get taken away from the streetlight project budget? Well, now you've got 20% of your lights done, but now in year two you decided that it's not going to be worth the council's time or council changes over. That happens and that's reality. And I think that when you talk about doing these projects in one lump project, not only do the financials outweigh it, but also the aesthetics and being able to get this done and now being able to achieve that as a city uh, really puts you guys on the map uh, in terms of updating your infrastructure and addressing an issue in a way that is self-funding rather than just using capital dollars over a period of 20 years or 10 years or whatever the cycle might be. Yeah, we just have to agree to disagree, but I, That's would, fine, I, would, I would say fine. your $3 million savings over five years isn't correct because you're phasing 20% a year, so that part. Uh, isn't that I, much? I was trying to do simple math in my head. It's, I, I just I don't want to get too big of numbers out there. That let's let's hear from Councilwoman Lamb and then. Okay, we my we should, question. Okay, mine's just a clarification um, because I have I got an amortization schedule from Brandon Kaufman and I think we've talked. Couple, no, I don't really need him up here. Yes. It just says twelve years and you said ten right. for the payback. So I'm just wanting to be clear on how many years. Right. So ten point four years if you if is the simple payback using the energy savings, the maintenance savings. And the, and the existing third conversion funding stream. If you pick the 2.5% interest rate, then, then Brandon's gonna amortize it out in order to account for the interest. So 
if you include the two million, it's about two million or so in interest over the period. Is that what you're saying? If we compute that, it's the extra two years. I'm going to bring Brandon up because he's the. Okay. He, did a, he did a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, I got it right. Oh, good. Thanks. Okay. Jane. Just a quick question to Brandon, talking about the, the financing as well. Um, we know it's not that common to do internal borrowing, but you did mention that um, when we purchased the system from LES, that cost was $17.6 million, and it was over a 10-year period? Yes. So have we paid that back? Yes, we have paid that back. Okay. And the city does other types of internal borrowings, like for TIF, 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 TIFs. So for small TIFs, there is a policy in place that has, allows up to $3.5 million. I think the West Hay Market JPA now has bought uh, three TIFs, and they have about $7.5 million invested. So is it a common practice for other municipalities, other jurisdictions, to use this mechanism of, of internal borrowing? I've seen internal borrowing done before. Like, for example, if uh, some cities issue short-term notes, uh, like a construction loan functionally for roads, big projects. So instead of going to market for those, they'll internal internal borrow themselves and then pay back the funds. So I've seen it done before in other municipalities. Okay, Is you. it short term? What's short term and what amounts? Uh, typically, sh so short term borrowing is, yeah, it just depends. I think in Nebraska, you can go up to two years for short term notes. I think it depends probably on your cash availability more than anything. Thank you. Yes, Lurian, thank you. I just wanted to confirm a few things about about the ESCO process. Um, we've talked about why ESCOs have an advantages over a straight out bidding process, and it has to do with the transfer of risk because you are guaranteeing, ESCO's guaranteeing the energy savings in that first year period and putting a cap on installation costs. Is that, can you confirm that? Yep. Yeah. Okay, and then what I also understand to be true is that um, if there are any shortfalls in the energy savings in that first year, the ESCO is going to refund that uh, for the net present value right. over the entire payback period, not just the first year. Is right. that correct? Yep. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, if I may. When that, Briefly, you first yeah. presented this to us, though, it was going to be a 12-year guarantee. And now you came back with a one-year guarantee. And that was the whole idea of the ESCO that the whole time. And now it's, so I don't think that flows with what my colleague it, just said. We moved said. away from the ESCO, though, didn't we? It really isn't an ESCO now. No. It's, well, yes, it's, it's an ESCO because an ESCO is a broad term in terms of an energy savings contract. And the reason it's an ESCO is because we're combining, as I said before, the engineering, the design, the evaluation, the analysis, the installation, the procurement, and the commissioning into one package, energy savings contract. You can create an ESCO in the way that works for you, and this is the way we think works for Lincoln in this one. You can have a, 10 different ESCOs be 10, 10 different if things. If it quacks, it must be a duck. <laughs> Mr. Connolly. Well, I was going to say, in terms of the guaranteed savings, um, the, it, that is correct, it, that they will pay it back not only for the first year, but they will, they, we're going to clarify the language to it, make it more clear that it will be extended out over the, over the term of the 15 years, which is really what the, uh, guarantee period was initially done. We're only going to be doing measuring and verification in the first year. That's true. But uh, in that first year, that's where the, the savings will be calculated, right. and they would pay that ba uh, based on a projection out over the 15 years. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. But if it actually goes higher, if we, we don't get the savings, then that's our loss. If I'm sorry. If, if the projections are incorrect, then we don't in the uh, second through the... Projections are projections. That's true. Uh, but at the same time, but, but you know, the we, the, the, but we, we're talking about, uh, we're not talking about boilers and other equipment they're going to have up and down uh, light bulbs. mounts. It's, 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 that's the whole reason why we felt like one year of measurement and verification was going to be appropriate here because it's, right. it's going to use the same amount of wattage every year thereafter. Right. That's, that's not going to change. Even if there's failures, there, there, there's, that's not going to change. So that's why we felt like the projections were going to be valid, estimating, and it would save the, save the money. You're estimating what that cost of the wattage will be in the next 10, 11 years. And is it, is it now you said 15 years. I thought this is 10.4 years. What, what, what is the, 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 guarantee, the guarantee term is one thing. The payback is a different term. Yeah. That's a different term. Guarantee goes longer than the payback. Correct. Guarantee is masking, ma matching your ESCO resolution specifically so that we can align with what you've already 
Okay. I think we've discussed this. Uh, Teresa, <laughs> what's, what's our next item? That would conclude our Thank public you. hearing on the public hearing resolutions. We can vote on these items. <clears throat> Item 5A is the report of new and pending claims against the city introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? We have a motion by Carl and a second by Jane. Is there any discussion of item 5A? Hearing none, would you call the roll, please? Kayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Freebold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 5 to 0. Item 5B is reappointing Jeff Kirkpatrick as the city attorney, introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Carl and second by Jane. Discussion? Please call the roll. Gayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 6 to 0. Item 5C, special permit 1989C, introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Carl, second by Jane. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Item 5D is the contract with Schneider introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Motion by Carl, second by Jane. Mr. Yes. I'd like to make Briefly. an amendment that we change it from one year to five years and the appropriate uh, changes in these related resolutions. Second. We have a motion by John and a second by Cindy. Discussion? Carl. Yeah, I, I, I can appreciate uh, what, what John is, is after uh, in terms of if there were some technology that might be better over a period of time. Um, but also we heard uh, from from the experts here uh, indicating that that we're losing twenty thousand dollars a week and delaying I don't want to throw that money away I'm ready to do it all Jane I agree I think it's something that we need to get done I can tell you that I've done property maintenance and management for 15 years and if I had a bigger capital investment budget, I would do it all at once and make sure that we convert it all to LED lighting because you see the savings and you reap the benefits of the energy savings going forward. And um, it, it makes sense for the city. We have the capacity, we have the internal borrowing uh, possibility that would, it seems like it's the best mechanism out there for us to achieve the savings that are projected to happen. We know. LEDs have come a long way over these 15 years. The price has come down, the, um, the energy savings have increased, and the ease of installation has increased, as well as the manufacturer's warranty on it. And you know, you, you can use LEDs for so many facilities, and we're seeing it become so commonplace in our homes as well, because families can enjoy the savings, and they can actually see the savings happen that very first month. So for that reason, I think it's a great opportunity for our city to move forward. Um, yes, of course there's going to be technological advances. I've seen it throughout my 15 years of transforming from T12s to T10s to T8s to T5s, and you know, but the beauty of it is with LED manufacturing, you know, they've made it so easy. You can just take out that old lamp and just pop in an LED because it'll match up with the ballast and you're, you can enjoy the savings going forward without the tremendous expense of changing out all your fixtures. So this makes sense for our city. I'm, I'm really proud of all the hard work everyone's put in and, and the te testimonies that was provided. But now's the time to get, to get this um, move forward. So anyone else like to speak on the amendment? Oh, sorry, no. No, that's where we are, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think my prior reasons are just there that I, I think this phase in helps us capture the advantages in a short period, but also uh, reduce the risk somewhat. Other discussion? Would you call the roll on the amendment? Gayla Baird? No. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? No. Shob? No. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? No. Motion lost two to four. Now we're back to the original motion. No, original, yes. I just want to emphasize what important infrastructure our streetlights are. 
for our city and by utilizing a contract with Schneider, um, we are looking at lowering our risk to install this infrastructure in terms of our fiscal risk. We're uh, doing something that's good for the environment and creating a more energy efficient program for our city. And I really appreciate their willingness to work with us uh, for specific needs raised by members of the public about uh, you know, making sure this works in residential districts that may have special concerns. So thank you. Others? Yes, Carl. Yeah, a um, year ago, LAS replaced uh, lights, put in LEDs around Cooper Park. It's a park, oldest park in our city. A uh, park that it's very dark and a neighborhood that's dark and they were thrilled uh, to have that improved lighting. Uh, some neighborhoods will, will want uh, less light and I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, that that's uh, adjustable in a way that, that should be able to, to work for them. Uh, but having the right light's the important thing, and I think this is the right light. Jane and then John. You know, the city has been doing this for a number of years. I've been on the Public Building Commission for seven years, and we have been doing this. We've been converting the uh, parking lot light fixtures quietly and enjoying the benefits. And so I think this is a wonderful program to, to jumpstart it and just accelerate our savings, so I will support it. John, please. I'm all for LEDs. Schneider's a great uh, company locally as well as nationally. I just feel based upon the experience I've seen over 36 years in property management that things change. And I just would really like on behalf of the taxpayer citizens as well as environmental impacts and everything to take it in a, a five year period. So I'm, I'm all in agreement with the LEDs. I just feel that based on my experience, we're gonna see so many new advances that this way we can hedge our bets, so if we did a five year so. Other than that, I'm supportive of the whole concept. Cindy. Thank you. Um, so I too am supportive of the concept. I, I do love uh, the idea of uh, wise use of our resources and energy savings. And all along, I think my big uh, problem has not been with changing out the LEDs. And I think I've made that clear to everyone that I've been speaking with. I have difficulty with the internal borrowing. I think uh, borrowing 12.2 uh, million from the people's basically rating their investment fund at a percentage that I think is is less than what we're seeing treasury bonds for and shifting the risk to the city to the people um, is is extremely troubling uh, to me without a vote of the people and I feel like that is exactly what we're doing we are you know there are some variables out there the savings for the energy itself is three hundred and sixty five thousand dollars a year the um, interest on the first interest payment on the first year is three hundred and five which nearly eats that savings but um, but more importantly <laughs> This is like, once again, using the people's credit card without asking the permission of the people. Um, and the folks that I've talked to that have contacted me about this have said, listen, the, um, we don't have that great of faith that the maintenance costs are not going to go up uh, at a greater degree. What we've seen over and over again is as we re reduce our use, the cost by the utility goes up. And so we're not confident that we're going to... Uh, that we're going to see the savings um, that that other folks see think that we're going to see, and in fact, if we don't, that's one thing. But if it's the city now, the people taking the risk for uh, past the first year of energy savings, and then taking the risk for the liquidity of their investment funds, um, because once it's invested, it's not uh, as liquid as it is, and, and that's problematic. And this is more than doubling the amount uh, that's been used for internal borrowing or that's in use right now. Um, I know that the was mentioned the, the JPA has about uh, uh, seven and a half million of about nearly 10 million that's out there already in internal borrowing. And I'm reminded back in 2016, we brought forward this council, we brought forward some uh, recommendations for some um, of those funds that were available and maybe we could use that to reduce uh, taxes uh, because we were having a tax increase for the people and we were asking for two million and at that point the response from city staff was that the sky was falling if we got that money out of those and not knowing which 
uh, accounts this is going to come out of, what are the resources, is especially troubling to me. So at this point in time, while I do and and would uh, would certainly support an LED project if there was perhaps another way of, of funding, um, I can't support it with internal borrowing. I just don't, uh, my, my constituents don't expect it. I don't think it's a responsible thing to do. So. Thank you. I'm going to say that I think this is a good project. And we were exchanging LEDs for other bulbs already. We had a plan in place, and we changed the plan. We went to a better plan. I think if our technology changes and we see a better plan, we'll revisit this and change it. I think this is a good first step, and we should move forward with this. Having said that, would you call the roll, please? Kayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? No. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? No. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried, four to two. Thank you. What's our next item? Next is item 5E, amending the fiscal year 1718 CIP for the LED street light conversion project, introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Carl and a second by Jane. Discussion? Yes. I just have a question. Thank you. So, so this in this uh, it indicates that it would be a twelve. Uh, the the CIP would reflect a twelve point five million dollar another financing, and I understand the total is twelve point two zero four nine zero nine five. Is that which is the accurate number? Uh, the twelve point two in the contract is the accurate number. Okay. And so, would we need to um, do we need to amend the this particular res uh, resolution in order to make it read 12.2? I mean, you could amend it to, I mean, I, there's a set amount for the contract, so we're not going to spend more than the 12.2, even if you authorize up to 12.5. I see. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd make a motion we amend to 12.2. Second. Okay. We have a motion by John and a second by Cindy to amend the resolution to reflect a different amount. Jane? So the question to Brandon is, if if we do substantial changes to the contract, I'm I'm sure the some of those costs of changes are already spelled out in the contract. But I know that we mentioned in controlling some of the lighting in the residential neighborhoods, so they have a full cutoff or maybe shields. I don't know if if we need that flexibility. I don't. I haven't reviewed the entire terms of the contract, so I don't know. Do we need that? Flexibility when we approve this, knowing full well that the contract is stipulated at a lower amount. I mean, if you leave it at that 12.2, uh, I'm sorry, at the 12.5, and there are change orders. At that point, you'd have appropriation available. If you set it at the specific amount per the contract, um, and there's additional costs that come back, then mm -hmm. we could potentially come back for an amendment to the CIP again. So basically, this would give us or the authority to not exceed 12.5 million. 12.5, yes. Okay. Cindy. Okay, so for clarification, I thought the whole thing of the ESCO was the price of the project would be guaranteed. That is correct, but... You have change orders. If there are change orders with that, such as backlighting, I, I, can, I'm, I don't know if I can speak for Schneider on this, but... Schneider can't charge us anymore, but should we choose to make some modification to the contract as the client, then you'd have that appropriation. We can't spend any more than 12.2 because that's what we, that's what you're giving us the approval to do is to exercise that contract. And Shiner's already said they think that they can do it within that 12.2. 12.5 just gives you the appropriation flexibility if there was a change order that someone wanted to do. I'm sorry, when you, when you say change order, you mean like that different lighting or different hoods, those would be the things? Right, or we wanted come... something more, or we decided we wanted something different while they were in the process. Yeah. The reason to go to five years. The other, other comments, questions? I, I just think, you know, we, if you've got to have changes of that magnitude that can't be worked in 12.2 million, then come back to us and then we'll right. adjust. But it's, it's not really any different than stuff you see in the CIP all the time. I know when I'm on planning commission, you may do a trunk sewer line, you may authorize $15 million in trunk sewer line appropriation to CIP, and they put it out to bid, and the bids come back at 13.8 million, or they come back at 14.2 million, or they may come back at 15.7 million, they have to come back and get a, an, an amendment. Well, you've but you've defined it at 12.2 million. Right. So we don't need to worry about that. Well, I mean, anybody who does change. projects knows that there are 
customarily change orders even though you don't anticipate or very don't want them meeting. and it's very right. clearly specified and lots of engineering has gone into this but you know if we change out and say we don't like those, the look of those residential lights in the older established neighborhoods that is something that you know is on us to 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 make right um but is it gonna i just i would rather have the flexibility rather than to have this brought back up for our approval or disapproval knowing that we can authorize up to 12.5 million i think mr henkel would like to say something i'd like to well, hear what he I says. Mean, there, there will be no change orders from schneider electric with the scope that's presented in that contract and and mr yes Henkel, please. Oh, sorry. when we talked earlier about the 579 poles in older neighborhoods that may need a different fixture. You said you thought you could do that within the scope of right. this contract, correct? Right. Okay. Thank you. For those for those fixtures in particular, but I think that uh, right. Councilman Councilman Rimble's uh, statement is correct. You know, if if LES or the city says, "Hey, we'd rather do something more or change out a fixture," you know, what we've agreed to in that contract is what's currently the 12.2 and change or whatever it might be. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't anticipate that. But I think the flexibility isn't a, isn't a horrible idea in case there is a fixture that um, that the city or that uh, the, the council would like to, to consider should that come up. Other questions, comments? So I think for no. clarification, what is the exact amount? I want to be fair to Mr. Henkel. 12.2 yeah, what? Uh, $12,204,095. Yep. And there's some sense in there. Yeah, so about, we'll round it up to $96. $96. So $12,204,96. <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's exactly what you just approved. So it's in the materials. So that's the amount. Yeah. So we have a motion by John, a second by Cindy, to amend this resolution. Would you call the roll, please? Gaylor Baird. Sorry, could you repeat the motion? I just want to understand is to amend um, from 12500000 to $12,204,096. In the contract that we just approved. Mm -hmm. I'll support that. Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? No. Shobe? No. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried, four to two. On the main motion, right? Yes. Now, now, yeah. Now onto the main motion. The amended motion. Yes. Gaylor Beard. Yes. Lamb. No. Raybold. Yes. Shobe. Yes. Camp. No. Eskridge. Yes. Motion carried, four to two. Next in are our public hearing ordinances, second reading. I'll call item six A and B together. They are annexation 18002, application of Ringneck Development, LLC, to annex approximately 33.56 acres of property generally located at Northwest 48th Street and West Holdridge Street, and change of zone 07063C, application of Ringneck Development, for a change from AG Agricultural to R3 Residential Planned Unit Development on approximately 42.05 acres of property generally located at Northwest 48th and West Holdridge Street. Good afternoon, members of the council. Danae Kalkowski, I'm appearing today on behalf of Ringneck Development. Um, the project we are bringing before you today has two applications. It's an application for an annexation and change of zone, and it really is just adding the next phase of development up at the Ringneck or Northwest 48th and I-80 development. I have a map here if we the picture's worth a thousand words and it was really going to shorten my presentation <laughs> but um, it, all of the maps are in your packet it really is um, simply just there we go there. So we've got Northwest 48th Street and then we've got uh, West Holdridge Street. So this is the residential component of the, um, I, the PUD. Um, and so what we're asking for is annexation of the area that's in red um, because the area, that little piece in blue is already annexed and then change of zone to R3 PUD 
uh, on the area that's outlined in blue. Uh, there is no amendment to the PUD because we've already approved the last amendment to the PUD approved the site plan. So we're not really making any changes to the site plan at this time. So that's why you just have in front of you the change of zone and the annexation. So all anticipated uh, in red to be uh, residential. Um, the area in blue under the PUD could be residential or um, neighborhood business. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Questions? Did you say um, how many new homes are anticipated? I'm sorry, I didn't see that in the staff report. I'm just curious. Um, we have 30 some acres. Uh, some are single family. We've got some town home lots in there. Um, I don't have the exact number, Larry, but I'd say you're, you know, three or four, probably at least per acre density. And I think there's some potential multifamily in that um, biz neighborhood business area. Thank you, John. I know you're not the developer, but we've had a lot of concern about affordable housing and we're trying to look at ways. Out of curiosity, do you have any idea what the developer is thinking the price point would be on these? Um, you know, John, I don't. I know they're in keeping. That's understandable. I'm not They've got the first lots out here that they're closing on now. Those are already under plat. Um, I don't. I'm yeah, sorry. That's fine. Others? Thank you. Thank you. So anyone else would like to speak on this item? Okay. Teresa, would you help us with our next item? All right, next I'll call items 6C and D together. They are change of zone 18010, application of Andre Ryback for a change from B1 local business and R2 residential to B3 commercial on property generally located at 11751A and 1425 South 118th Street and from B1 local business to R2 residential at 11818A Street. That's a lot of ones there. There is. Approving a conditional zoning agreement between the city and Old City Building Group for installation of fencing and screening along the boundaries of property located at 11751A Street and 1425 118th Street in Walton. Thank you. Is there someone here to talk about this item? Hello, Good afternoon. Uh, Andre Ryback, uh, 9338 Northern Sky Road. Um, we would just like to uh, uh, get the zoning change to B3 just so it can accommodate um, a building that we want to build on it. Uh, currently, on there's two properties, um, and we're going to combine them together to tear down uh, the existing buildings that are on there and just build one uh, storage with, a, with an office on it. All right, thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, would you call the next item? All right, that would conclude our public hearing portion. I have a we'll question, a clarification. Just, just, just thinking, a moment. I apologize yes. for interrupting. Oh, no. um, back on the John's amendment vote, did you, did you say it was 4-2, and was that accurate? The amendment to change the CIP from 12.5? I have 4-2. No. No, I supported it. Uh, John, Cindy, and I voted together. That makes three, which means it's... Hello. Oh, you did. Yes. You, you went my way. Oh, sorry. I have two. Yeah. Okay. Or two. What's that? I apologize. I, I, oh, I misunderstood the two. vote. I wanted to clarify Thank because you. if it was 3-3, three, three, that would imply... You know, no, then it would have okay. carried over. Yeah. Thank you. I have Gaylor, Baird, Lamb, Camp, okay. and Eskridge voted for it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Ordinances third reading then. Item 7A is amending the pay schedule for the employee group whose classifications are assigned to the pay range, which is prefixed by the letter E, by creating the classification of city council secretary. Introduced by Gaylor Baird. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion by Gaylor Baird and a second by Carl. Cindy, would you like to speak to this? Thank you. Yes, I would. Thank you. So this is reappearing uh, with, regarding to our, with regard to our staff position. And um, because as chair, um, Councilman Christensen was uh, intricately involved in this, I'd like to ask to delay it. But I also want to um, just one more time for action. And I want to make sure, though, that Jane can be back uh, also. And I think she's gone the 11th. So I would ask it be delayed to the 18th for final action. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. So we have a motion by Cindy and a second by Jane to place this on pending. I think it's already listed here until the 18th. Any discussion? Uh, would you call the roll on the amendment? 
Kaylor Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Yep. Items. We don't have to vote on the main motion. Thank you. Thank you. Item 7B is Street and Alley Vacation 17004. This is vacating the Ash Street right-of-way located east of Colonial Drive and west of South 33rd Street, introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. We have a motion by John and a second by Leary. And any discussion on this item? The historical records are really cool. I don't know if you guys saw the images. They're kind of fun. Thank you, Ed Zimmer, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Other comments? Uh, okay. Next, please. Gayla Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Thank you. Our I think there's six of us, though. I'm sorry, 6 to 0. That was my <laughs> first flub. Okay. This is going to be a go down in the history books. It's my <laughs> best first meeting. Oh, ever. no, I've had worse. <laughs> Personally, I've had worse. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not names. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, resolutions on first reading are items 8A through 8E. Yes. Our ordinances on first reading are items 9A through 9D. Our pending list date certain is the one item that will be on um, June 18th. Our pending list are items 11A through C. I'll entertain a moment. Is this, is this, yeah, this is not an open meeting tonight, right. so we don't have to do that. Correct. I hear a motion for adjournment by Councilman Camp. Second. Second by Councilman Eskridge. Is there any discussion? I hear none. Call the roll. Kayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. I own a personal comment. I'd like to thank everyone for their help today. I dropped the ball several times, and you guys were there for me. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>